Hi folks. So I've gotten a lot of questions recently from some of you who are working independently, but also people who are on my teams in the past as well as my current teams about some issues pertaining to infrared excesses, spectral energy distributions, magnitudes, filters, uh, color magnitude and color color diagrams, and reddening. So I thought I would try to pull together some of the slides that I've been using for some of my summer visits from the past several years, but also all pulled together and updated and streamlined a little bit. So I have a whole series of slides that are going to go through a lot of these concepts. Now I've necessarily, because this is, you know, we're going one direction forward in time here, I've sort of arranged this linearly. But all of these concepts are all interrelated, all bound up together. So this is going to take some thought on your part to try to put it together and you may need to go through some of these concepts more than once. So. Um, I, of course, I'm studying young stars, and so for most of my, uh, my work. So uh, in that context, we have a central star um, surrounded by a huge circumstellar disk, and that disk is made out of dust and gas. And because it's made out of dust, uh, it is absorbing light from that central star and then re-emitting it in the infrared. And so when you are observing a, a young star that has a disk, you see light from the central object, but also infrared from the disk around it. In other words, you see more infrared than you would expect from a plain star or an infrared excess. Um, here's another way of representing that. This comes from a public press release, so it doesn't really have um, very many units, but it gets the concepts across. So on this uh, in this diagram here, we've got brightness as a function of wavelength. And if you have just a plain star, you have a shape that looks kind of like that. If you have a big, thick dust disk, um, or for that matter, a dust shell, um, you'll have a little bit more light in the optical than you might from just the plain star, but a lot more light than you'd get in the infrared than you would from just a plain star. If you have a star with a dust belt around it, then you're seeing the star tell out fairly far, and then you get the infrared excess at the longer bands. So um, in all of these cases, we're not resolving, we're not seeing the dust dis disk or shell, we're inferring its presence based on the infrared excess. So um, this is what an actual uh, research quality SCD looks like. So on this axis we have lambda f lambda, we'll talk more about that in a minute, in the log, and then wavelength also in the log. And so you have contribution assumed to be from the plane photosphere here, um, but then the actual data points go like this. And this is the amount of infrared excess, the excess emission over the photosphere. It turns out there's also a little bit of ultraviolet excess and We'll talk more about that in a completely different tutorial. So the whole point is that if you observe in the mid and far infrared, you can actually see the dust uh, around these stars. You're not re Again, you're not resolving the disk. You're inferring its presence from the presence of infrared excess because we're getting that thermal dust emission in the mid and far infrared. And so if you actually observe a large collection of stars at a variety of ages, um, the disk probably clears after a few million years. Now, some of the uh, other people that look for infrared accesses are looking for infrared accesses around giants. This would come from an expulsion of matter uh, in a dusty shell or disk from the star, also resulting in excess emission over the photosphere. So. Um, Here's uh, SEDs that come from one of my papers studying objects in the beta pic moving group. Um, in this case, you're not seeing the turnover at the peak of the SED, but as you still have log lambda f lambda on the y-axis and log lambda in microns on the x-axis. And you have photometric points here that go down and then come up again. And that tiny little infrared excess is the circumstellar, in this case, belt uh, circumstellar um, ring around these stars. But um, the really important, th there's some important things to know here. These are really tiny disks compared to the ones on the, the illustrated in the prior couple of pages. Um, and these are uh, correspondingly older stars. These are actually called debris disks. They're sort of asteroid belts or Kuiper belts you can think of around these stars, but they're, they're very dusty and so you get the infrared excess. Um, the other important thing to note is I've, I've worked with some people who assume that SEDs, like the spectral energy distributions, because the lambda F lambda is an energy, that think that you can only have photometry on spectral energy distributions. That's not true. That black line there 
is actually spectra. You can kind of see it getting noisier on the edge. You can see an emission feature there. Um, that Those are actual spectra from Spitzer in the infrared. And so you can put spectra and photometry on an SED, but they do have to be calibrated. You can't just take a picture and um, try to law measure counts and drop it in here, you actually have to calibrate it. You actually have to understand how your photometry compares to standards and actually calibrate it in order to get it on this plot. But the important thing is you can have photometric points as well as spectroscopic points on an SED. Now, um, a lot of you have been working with IRAC data um, or WISE data. So here I have an example again of lambda f lambda, so energy as a function of wavelength. This time the wavelength is linear. Uh, the, the, the lambda f lambda, the energy, is still in the log. Uh, and then we have here representations of a vega disk, a vega star, in other words just a plain star. You can see some absorption lines in there. And then this has a star plus a disk. And then there are some lines on here that indicate the pass bands for the four Iraq band passes. And then here we have the slightly younger model, which is a pro, you know, a star plus an envelope around it. And this is an absorption feature that comes from silicates in the dust. But again, we have these four Iraq band passes. So what exactly does it mean when we say the Iraq band passes? Well, you can, I'm going to try to represent this in PowerPoint, but if you've ever played with gels from like theater supplies where, or, or those old-fashioned 3D glasses that were blue and red, if you hold up one of those gels to your eye and look at something, you kind of are seeing the world through a red filter or a green filter or a blue filter. And in the idealized imaginary case, when you do that, not only does the world look red, but what exactly what you're seeing changes. And in an ideal case, you would have a perfect ideal filter that's a top hat function. In other words, it doesn't let any light in through the blues and greens and the yellows and the oranges, but just lets in red light and then falls off when you get to the to the, the other reds. So ideally that's what would happen. Turns out reality is pretty mess, much messier than that. So this is a real R-band filter transmission curve. Here we have relative transmission as a function of wavelength. This is an R-band filter from Kip Peak. And you can see that it's trying to match our idealized top hat function with no transmission and then an abrupt rise. And it's not really flat. And then an abrupt fall. Okay, It's trying to do that, but the reality of the world is that you can't make it idealized. And so there is a tiny slope to this, and then because of the stuff that goes into making that filter, it's not flat at the top. It's trying, but note also that you're always going to lose some light. They try really hard to make sure it transmits as much light as possible, but you're always going to lose some light when you go through a transmission curve. Um, and then here you're letting, un, you know, it's not flat. They're letting some wavelengths in and blocking more of some other wavelengths. And then it's trying really hard to fall flat, but look, look at that long tail. Even though you don't have very much transmission here, if you had something that was emitting almost all of its energy at 8,000 angstroms, this so-called red leak would bite you. Because if you are measuring just all the photons that come to you through this filter, it's going to total up. It's going to integrate all the photons that come through this filter. So if you're getting a lot of photons through here and not very many photons through here, you're still going to measure something that's pretty bright, even though you have not very much transmission out here. And that's the reality. And that is just the reality that you have to work with. And you have to think about when you're, un when you're interpreting the measurements that you make, you have to think about the shape that you're expecting to see of, en of uh, energy emitted as a function of wavelength, but the reality and, and the reality of what exactly the filter is transmitting. Here's several more filter band passes. Um, the clear filter uh, tries to let as much light through as possible. You've got a U-band filter. Note it's really not flat at all. It doesn't rise as steeply as you would like. There's B, which also has a long filter. Here's an R filter, again, with a really long tail of a red leak. Um, here we have Sloan G and Sloan R and Sloan I and then we and Sloan Z. And then we also have some so-called narrow band filters. You see how much more narrow they are than these broad band filters. These narrow band filters are designed to only let in light really, really close to a specific wavelength. So this is a forbidden line of oxygen. This is H alpha. So that's when when you hear people talk about narrow band or broadband filters, this is what they mean, and this is where the nomenclature 
comes from. Another way of, uh, oh, here's another set of filter band passes. Uh, we've talked before about how it's really hard to do infrared from the ground. Well, this is near infrared, and these are the filter band passes for J, H, and K. But look, they've also put in here a black transmission, a transmission profile. And this transmission profile is the atmospheric transmission. And so you get these bytes taken out of the, your signal from extraterrestrial sources um, by the water and the carbon dioxide in the air. And so you end up with these big bites taken out of your spectrum. But you can see that they have tried really, really hard to match these astronomical filters to the band passes provided by the atmosphere. It wouldn't do you very much good to define a filter that just dealt with this gap if you were observing from the ground because you would never get any photons. And so they've defined the filters to match that atmospheric transmission for a reason. Uh, now, when you work with two mass, it's not just J, H, and K, it's J, J, H, and K short. That K short comes from the fact that it ends sooner than standard Johnson K does. Johnson K goes out further, but they created K short because they were trying to avoid this absorption, this really messy absorption feature from the atmosphere. Here are the four Y's bands. They're of four and a half, three and a half, four and a half, uh, 12, and 24 microns. Now, I say that somewhat cavalierly. Look how broad that filter is, but it's centered it on 12, and so we call it a 12 micron filter, even though it's pretty broad. Another thing to note is that they're really not top hat functions. They're trying, but look, the three and a half is kind of substantially not flat. Also look at how different the transmission is. You get, we're trying to get a lot of the light through Ys1 and Ys2. The Ys3 and Ys4 fall off a lot, okay? That's important to note, too, when you're thinking about what expected brightness is that you should see from any given object. So there's a lot of filter band passes I've given you. This is another way of thinking about the same concept. Technically, this is reflection and not transmission, but the basic idea is the same. Here, in this case, instead of brightness or energy, we have power, similar, not the same, but for purposes of this example, it's essentially the same concept as a function of wavelength. And what this person did was they put a box of Crayola crayons, one at a time, into a special a device that really precisely measures the color of the crayon. So look, the white crayon rises quickly in the blue and it's pretty flat throughout the entire wavelength range. This set of reds, very little blue through, comes up and then is pretty flat through the reds. And exactly where it comes up, where it rises, is a function of exactly what color it is. Then you get into the greens. Look, they rise and they fall again. Here's some more greens. Rise and then fall again. Now we get into some violets. They rise over here and then fall. And then the black is straight across. So not quite the same thing as the filter transmission curves, but the same concept. If it looks red, then it's in reflecting most of its light in the red. Astronomical filters, if you've ever seen them, they are the most intense, for example, the red filter is the most intense red you have ever seen because it is literally just letting the red wavelengths through. And this, the, the same is true for a lot of the other filters if you've ever actually seen them. So Let's go back now to this plot that we had from before. We still have energy as a function of wavelength, and now you have a better sense of these four IRAC band passes. They're three and a half, four and a half, eight, uh, sorry, three and a half, four and a half, five point eight, and eight microns. Here again, you know, that's pretty broad, and I'm calling it eight microns because that's the effective wavelength of the of the filter. So now we still have the scaled vega, the plane star here, and then a star plus a disk, and then a younger star here. Before we can talk about exactly measuring the excesses here, we have to actually talk about the units involved. So infrared astronomy units are can be somewhat complicated. Hopefully you already know about microns. Microns are micrometers or a millionth of a meter. And then mostly in the uh, optical you get wavelengths in angstroms or nanometers, um, but they're about half a micron. In, in units of microns, and then you can, you know, there's near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared. The definitions of exactly where those boundaries are pretty squishy. Depend, you know, frankly, it depends on who you're talking to, and sometimes how you detected the light, and all these other issues. But still, it's a large range, and you can see that microns is kind of a good unit to use because it cover, covers that that weight range of wavelengths. Now it gets a little bit more sticky. 
brightnesses or fluxes technically, their flux densities, are going to be given in Janskys. And this comes from the heritage of how a lot of people who started in infrared were coming into the infrared from working in the radio. And this is really the way that you spell the unit um, when it's plural. It's not IES, it's YS because it's named for Carl Jansky, who was a radio astronomer. And so that's part of why a lot of the units that we've inherited in the infrared are in this, these funny flux density units called Janskys because of the history of coming from the radio. Janskys are, you know, you can treat it like any other unit, millijanskys, microjanskys. A lot of the brightnesses that we talk about in the context of Spitzer or Wise are millijanskys or microjanskys. A jansky in the infrared is actually really, really, really bright, so there's not too many sources that are that bright. This is how you convert a jansky to SI units, so you can see there's a pretty big exponent there. You can, and you will, do the work of converting in between Janskys and magnitudes. I guarantee you, you will not do it right the first time. You will be off by many orders of magnitude the first time. But you can do it, and you should do it, and because it's an important exercise to move back and forth between these units. And so magnitudes are what people in the optical use. And as more and more people are using the infrared, we, you know, the, those people coming from the optical into the infrared have brought with them their intuition and their standards of using magnitudes, like in the optical, which is why it's important to move back and forth between these units. Um, the convention in the infrared, uh, in the optical, you have uh, names of filters like, J, you know, like U, B, V, R, I or U-G-R-I-Z. In the infrared, we don't have letters necessarily. Some people do. There's L, M, N, and Q. But um, for a lot of the space-based uh, infrared bands, you, the name of it is the, is the effective wavelength of the filter, but enclosed in brackets. And so what this means when you see bracket 3.6 is the measurement at 3.6 microns in units of magnitudes. So again, units are challenging but really important. Here are some high level issues to think about. Flux densities, which is technically what a Jansky is, um, sometimes people get really sloppy even in written documents and people refer to them as fluxes. Technically it's flux densities if it's Jansky. They're energy per unit area per unit time per photon, in other words per wavelength or per hertz. Okay. Brighter sources, these, these in flux densities, they work the way you think. Brighter sources have bigger numbers. And flux densities are linear units. In other words, a flux density twice as much as something else is twice as bright. Okay? Um, and you can work with flux densities in units of Janskys, which are technically per hertz, or in uh, slightly different units of per centimeter or per micron for a per wavelength. Okay? And SEDs, though, SEDs are spectral energy distributions. So in order to formally plot an SED, you need to get those flux densities into units of energies. Okay? You can't plot just magnitudes. You've got to, to actually plot the energy density in order to make it work. And so when you're plotting an SED, you need to work with energy density and wavelength, and these plots should always be log-log. Okay, but energy densities like flux densities are linear. In other words, something that has twice as much is has a twice as large a number as twice as much energy. Now, magnitudes, by definition, are flux ratios. And we're going to talk more about this in a second. But they are ratios of fluxes that have the log incorporated into it. And this is the confounding thing, they are somewhat backwards in that brighter sources have smaller numbers and they're logarithmic units. So something that has twice the magnitude, say between fifth magnitude and tenth magnitude, is a hundred times fainter in flux density. So it's going to hurt your brain the first couple of times you try to move back and forth between these units, but it will become easier with time. There is a page on the Cool Wiki on units that goes through what is flux, what is luminosity, what is flux density, what is magnitudes. It's got all this stuff spelled out. In fact, if you actually go, um, it's actually just called units. And there's just stuff on the top about general units, and there's fluxes, flux, 
uh, flux densities, fluxes, luminosities, um, and then specifically talking about units of Spitzer images and units of Spitzer photometry, specifically magnitudes and SEDs. And then after this, it goes through, um, there's something called the aperture photometry tool that many night sharps uh, teachers have used. Uh, in order to make that work, you need to put in a particular number to help APT convert between flux densities and magnitudes. So um, that 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 is where you can go for more information. So uh, again, you're going to have to stare at this and think about this for a while and actually start playing with these values and then go back and think about this some more. It's hard to keep it all straight, I realize, but it's important for understanding um, what we're going to do next, basically. All right, so a magnitude is defined to be a flux ratio. Okay, so you probably remember this. Magnitude of object number one minus magnitude of object number two is 2.5 times the log of the flux ratio. See, one, two, and then one is on the denominator here. The ratio of the fluxes is the difference in magnitudes. Now, the magnitude system, specifically in the optical, has been de defined pinned on Vega. So a star, the star called Vega is defined to be zero magnitude. So if you stick in Vega for object number two here, you have the magnitude is equal to 2.5 times the log of the ratio of fluxes of with F Vega on the top and the flux of your star here. Or your object doesn't have to be a star. But it's the magnitude isn't if, if you have just one number, it's implicitly a ratio with Vega. Now this gets really, really complicated in the infrared because when they went and looked at Vega with IRAS in 1983, the, fig, the first big all-sky survey in the infrared, IRAS is the infrared array satellite, in, I'm sorry, infrared astronomy satellite, they discovered that Vega did not look like they expected. Vega, it turns out, has a large infrared axis. It has a dusty disk around it. So, just complicating matters. Infrared magnitudes are defined with respect to what Vega would be if it didn't have a disk. So, you can imagine that this makes it squishy to define because now you're, you've entered into it models, models of what you think Vega should be if it didn't have a disk. And this is why different infrared systems can be calibrated a little bit differently because it depends on how they defined what Vega would be if it didn't have a disk in order to define their magnitude system. But look, so I defined this a second ago by saying magnitude of object 1 minus magnitude of object 2. This also works if you have the magnitude of, of an object at one band minus a measurement of that same object at a different band is 2.5 times the log of the fluxes of the same object through two different bands. And this is the definition of a color. So when we say like B minus V or U minus B, this is the ratio of the fluxes at those two bands for the same object. So oh, before I move on, if you're working with Sloan data, it's even worse. Okay, it turns out that Sloan people for the most part study galaxies. And so rather than pinning their magnitude system on the shape of a star, they decided to define all their magnitudes with respect to a perfectly idealized flat spectrum. So these are called AB magnitudes rather than Vega-based magnitudes. And so for that definition, instead of F Vega on the definition of magnitudes, use 3631 Jansky for all bands. I'm sorry, this is a pain in the butt. I hate AB magnitudes because I am not an extragalactic astronomer. It is a giant pain. If you just pull magnitudes out of Sloan, you are going to have to think about that before adding them to your SEDs if you're using Vega-based magnitudes like you get from WISE or uh, TUMAS or many optical surveys. So you're going to have to worry about this if you're using Sloan data. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, Sloan has a long history of working in some funny units. The very first Sloan data I ever worked with came in nano maggies, and those are even more challenging to convert. So colors. Colors are differences in magnitudes which means they are also a flux ratio. But now that Vega cancels out when you do this, the distance doesn't matter. Remember here, if I've got this magnitude of the same object at two different bands, then I don't even have to particularly 
calibrated, as long as I've, the two are calibrated in the same way, the difference in magnitudes, the ratio of the fluxes, I don't have to tie it back to vega. I also don't have to worry about the distance that the thing is at. The difference in magnitudes at two different bands for the same object is the ratio of the fluxes. Okay, so um, you should do the math. You should go and get the definition of magnitude. You should go and get the definition of absolute magnitude that involves d. You need you can work through the math and convince yourself that distance doesn't matter. So when you're thinking about colors. In some funny way, you can also think of this as a comparison of fluxes or flux densities along the shape of the Vega spectrum. So let's go here. Here we have again energy as a function of wavelength, the four Iraq band passes, a scaled plane star Vega. So now you understand scaled Vega means what Vega would be if it didn't have a disk. This is these people's model of Vega without a disk. And this is a star plus a disk. And this is a much younger star that has an envelope of dust around it. So there's no, you know, there's not very much energy coming out, making it out through the envelope, through the cocoon of matter at the short wavelengths. Okay. So if you kind of tilt your head sideways so that Vega is kind of flat, you can sort of in your mind's eye subtract off that Vega contribution from the star plus disk contribution and get just the disk. So you should think about which band here is going to have the smallest magnitude and will it be the brightest and then it has the largest flux density. Think about that. I'm not going to give you the answer. You need to think about it. So you need to take your understanding of filters and the definition of magnitudes and your uh, emerging understanding of SEDs and think about applying it to stars in order to figure out what colors you should see. One thing that I think is useful to think about is that a spectral energy distribution is looking at data from many different wavelengths all at once for just one object or a few objects if you're going to make a really complicated plot. A color magnitude diagram or a color color diagram is allowing you to look at just a few bands for many objects at once. So in one case you're looking at many wavelengths for one object, in the other case you're looking at many objects for a few wavelengths. In order to understand, based on SEDs, what colors to expect, where you expect objects to fall in a color color or color magnitude diagram, you can sort of approximate stars as black bodies. They're not really black bodies, but we can fake it, especially at the longest wavelength. So what is a black body? Black body is something that just is emitting thermal radiation. In other words, it's heated up and it's emitting light. You are black bodies. So are the heating elements in your toaster. You can watch them heat up when you hit toast and they go from black into this sort of deep red and then red and then orange and then yellow. That's heating up and getting a brighter and brighter uh, uh, intensity for in the black body curve. We can, uh, we can assume that stars are black bodies. Sometimes we can also assume that their disks are black bodies and then add two black bodies together to get the star plus the disk. Now, in the past, I have worked with people, many people, who have confused the word SED, meaning spectral energy distribution, and black body. They are not interchangeable. A black body has a mathematical definition of the shape of the curve. You can assume that the emission from the star is a black body curve, but that is not the same thing as saying the SED. So when you're talking about features in the SED, don't say features in the black body, you mean features in the SED. Okay. Now, things to note here. We've got brightness as a function of wavelength in two different plots, and the wavelengths of visual, visible light are marked here and you've got black bodies of three different temperatures and you can see because they've plotted it linearly the shape is changing but the peak is moving to the blue as you're getting hotter and hotter and it's getting brighter and brighter. Here's another way of looking at it here we've got power as a function of wavelength and that peak wavelength is getting bluer and bluer as you're getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay now here I have a movie I'm going to let the movie go and we're going to talk about what's going on. So what I have here is lambda f lambda, so energy as a function of wavelength, both in the log. Up here I've got temperatures, effective temperatures are defined for various types as the, the shape 
that the temperature that the star would have if it was really a black body. That's the definition of effective temperature. So what I did is I looked up a list of spectral types and the, temp the effective temperatures that they correspond to, and I calculated and plotted a black body curve for each one of these temperatures. So it starts at M8 and gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And you can see that the whole thing is getting brighter and brighter and brighter, but the peak is moving further and further and further and further to the blue. These almost completely illegible things here are marking the locations of the filters. Here's UBVRI, there's JH and K in here. We've got the four IRAC bands, we've got MIPS, three MIPS bands. Okay. Now, it's not, the overall brightness is increasing. It's not just the same, it's the same shape, but it's the overall brightness is increasing as the T increasing, as the T increases, and the peak is moving bluer. The UV and optical filters are often, let me pause that for a second. Let me go back to the beginning and pause it. Stop. Okay. The UV and optical are some on the, this side of the curve. This side is called the Veen side. This side is called the Rayleigh gene side. So UV filters are often on the wind side, and the optical filters generally are going to cover the peak of this distribution. And the infrared filters are going to be on the Rayleigh gene side. Let me let this go again where you can look at where those filters are. So now the peak is finally out of the optical and the UV. We got some O stars. We're going to go all the way back down to M's. Okay, so if you look at that, the, sh the slope in the infrared is not changing. It's just getting brighter. But the slope of that curve through the optical changes a lot. So if you're going to take the ratio of fluxes along that curve, in other words, get the magnitude difference in the infrared, say K minus 24 or IRAC 1 minus IRAC 4, the infrared colors are always going to be zero magnitudes for regular stars that don't have disks that you can approximate by a black body curve. They're not going to be zero for things that don't have this SCD shape. Now, if all the data you have on a given object is J, J, and K, and IRAC, you can tell some things about the source. I mean, if you go out to M's, for example, you can see it's starting to pull over by the time you get to K. So you can tell some things about the source, but it's really the peak and the vein side that is telling us a lot about what these objects are because the shape, the shape of that curve is changing rapidly as it goes through the optical bands as a function of temperature. Now, reddening matters too. And we're, not, we're going to talk about it eventually, but not right now. But the fact that this shape is changing rapidly through the optical is why you can use B minus V or R minus I or any of these other combinations to give you a guess at the spectral type of the star because it's giving you a guess at the temperature. So you've probably seen color magnitude diagrams like this, where you have the absolute V magnitude on this band, on this y-axis, and B minus V on the x-axis. Because of that plot, that movie that I just showed you, where B and V are near the peak of that SED curve, you can map B minus V colors to temperature. And once you've converted V magnitudes to absolute magnitudes, in other words, converted them uh, compensated for distances, you can map this to how bright each individual star is compared to the others. So you can make plots like this and you can understand, okay, stars spend most of their life on the main sequence and then they evolve off and become um, giants and they move down here and they become white dwarfs. Lots and lots of deep physical insights have come from this diagram. But you are not able to make a cool diagram exactly like this for mid-infrared colors because mid-infrared colors will tell you about things that don't look like Vega. But if you need a temperature for your source, you need to be looking in the optical.
But you can tell from the structure in this diagram something about the physical nature of the sources we're looking at. You know that this clump is the main sequence, you know that this is red giants, and you know, you've, you've studied this before, I'm sure. So based on your understanding of where objects fall, if I give you a brand new object about which you knew nothing and told you it fell in this part of the diagram, you could say with some confidence, hey, that's a giant. So you can learn something about new objects by learning where they fall in this diagram. Same thing is true even in the infrared. When you're doing infrared color magnitude diagrams and color color diagrams, you're looking at different parts of the SED than you are in the optical, but you can still learn about the things that you're looking at. Things that look like Vega, or rather what Vega would be if it didn't have a disk, have all their infrared points on the Rayleigh gene side of the SED, and so they all have an infrared color of zero as long as you're doing short to long. So K minus 8, K minus 24, 2 minus, uh, or 3 and a half minus 8, 3 and a half minus 12, 3 and a half minus 22, all of those colors are going to be zero for plain stars. So here's a real life IRAC color color diagram. Here's 3.6 minus 4.5. Remember the bracket notation means I'm taking the difference in magnitudes. 3.6 minus 4.5. This is the same fundamental thing as the ratio of fluxes. So 3.6 minus 4.5 on this axis, 5.8 minus 8 on this axis. Where are the plane stars? Near zero in both axes. This clump are the things that don't have disks. But we have a large population here of other things that don't have zero color, and those are the interesting objects. Here's someone trying to understand in that specific diagram that I just gave you, the 3.6 minus 4.5 versus 5.8 minus 8. Given models, they're plotting where they think these objects are going to fall. Here are their plane stars, a big clump of them there, and the smear of objects up this way. For their models, they're getting the very young stars that still have cocoons around them over here, and the things that have disks around them, not cocoons, just disks, are here. So here's another one, 3.6 3 minus 4.5 versus 5.8 minus 8. Here are the photospheres, here are the class 2s, here are the class 1s, class 2s are the things that just have disks, class 1s are the things that still have cocoons. Now, look, smearing in this direction for all of these things. That is the influence of reddening. Let's pull, I'll get to reddening more in a second. Sorry, I forgot I had some more color magnitude diagrams and color color diagrams in here. Here's 3.6 minus 5.8, 8 minus 24. Again, plane zeros are the plane stars. And we have things with um, rings of dust around them, debris disks. And we have things with big disks and things with big envelopes. Here's another example, K versus K minus 24. Here, these are this is a field that's supposed to be just stars and galaxies, and here the shades of gray are corresponding to how many sources appear. There's a lot of plain stars here at a variety of brightnesses. There's a lot of faint red things, and these are the galaxies. Here we have different pieces of this giant cloud called the Perseus molecular cloud. Um, things with small amounts of excesses, things with larger excesses. Some of the things that are red and faint are indeed galaxies, but some of these things out here are not galaxies. They are young, low-mass stars. Um, okay. So in 2004, when Spitzer was new, one of the plots I showed you came from Allen et al. 2004, and they were the ones doing some simple models to try to figure out well where different young stars should be. Now, Early on, when Spitzer was new, we were still trying to feel out where things could go. And so people started to include MIPS bands and make simple plots. As we got more and more data of more and more things that we knew about, um, that's what the Ribola et al. 2007 plots were of the um, Perseus molecular cloud. You can look at just extragalactic fields that are foreground stars and galaxies, look at where those colors are, and then look for things that are different in the star forming regions, which is what we were doing in that paper in 2007. So you can play around with objects that you think you understand and then compare them to objects you don't know about yet. So what mid-infrared color does any plane star have? You better know this. If not, go back and rewind the video. Remember how this works because whenever you're presented with a new IR color magnitude diagram or color color diagram, it'll start to let you figure out what's going on. Now, we talked about IR excesses. In order to actually put a measure on how much excess an object has, you actually have to work in SED space, spectral energy distribution space. Here we have lambda F lambda energy as a function of wavelength. 
there's the um, energies of function building for the star and the star plus disk. That's the excess. So in order to actually put a measure on it, you need to fit the star and measure the ratio. But remember, colors are flux ratios. So if you actually just say 3.4 minus 22 is 0, then you know it doesn't have an excess, as long as you know it's a star. 3.4 minus 22 of 1.5 magnitudes means that it has 1.5 magnitudes of infrared excess at 22 microns. It's important to note the wavelength at with which you're working because the amount of excess changes depending on the wavelength you're working on. But being able to make that statement strongly about, oh, it has 1.5 magnitudes of infrared excess, you have to know that it's a star. It doesn't work that way if it's extragalactic. So we can start looking at where things fall in color magnitude and color color diagrams by saying, okay, if we assume it's a star, what color should it have, and how are these things different? The colors you might use to, to pick out things depends on exactly what you're looking for and exactly where you're looking. And the truth is that you can find all sorts of objects in all sorts of places in all sorts of color magnitude diagrams. So you have to start making educated guesses, statistical estimates. In other words, things brighter than this are more likely to be young stars than things fainter than this. Or things that are this red are more likely to be galaxies than things that are not this red. You also want to use all the data you can find, not just a few bands because you have to be careful about what might be lurking in there and not be a young star. So these were the earliest simple cuts that they did. Here's a plot that I showed you earlier, 3.6 minus 4.5 versus 5.8 minus 8, and they were just marking out regions of this particular diagram. But it turns out that there's lots of things that could be young stars and could not be. So this is, I'm sorry to change um, satellites on you, this is now wise, but this is where I got this cool figure. 3.4 minus 4.6 in magnitudes versus 4.6 minus 12. And this comes from a paper where they were looking at specific kinds of galaxies and T dwarfs. So again, the stars are going to be down here where there's no color, but then you have elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, all these other kinds of galaxies, and look, they're red in both bands, just like young stars are. That's a problem. T dwarfs are so cool that the head, that the peak of that SED, I didn't make you any T dwarfs. I stopped at M8 in that mid movie earlier. But if you keep going cooler and cooler and cooler SEDs, you can see that the peak of that SED is going to start moving into the infrared, which is why T dwarfs, even without disks, don't have zero color. And this is why they picked these particular bands on these particular missions exactly where they did, is because it makes it easier to find. L and T and even Y dwarfs by looking at where they fall in this diagram. Okay, so when you're if you're looking at any given region, you want to try to use your data from as many different bands as you can get your hands on. You want to use experience with other regions. In other words, most normal galaxies fall here, AGB stars fall there, and so you want to try to use color cuts in more than one diagram to weed out the chaff to find the wheat that you're looking for. I find it easier if you use a gigantic catalog because then you can see where their clumps are in the diagram. I don't mean 10 or 50 objects, I mean 100, 1,000, 10,000 objects. And I know that's hard for you guys when you're working with Excel, but it's really much easier to find the weird ones if you have enough points in your diagram that you can see texture in the diagram, that you can see where things clump. So with Wise, Wise is shallower compared to Spitzer. It's not as sensitive as Spitzer, but the infrared is still seeing lots and lots of things. And so it's really easy to see galaxies even when you are looking in a star forming region because you're seeing through the dust into the background. Turns out star formation everywhere, whether it's in another galaxy or here, has similar colors. So if you do color cuts, you can find a starburst galaxy forming ga stars over there, not over here. And so you have to worry about using wavelengths um, other wavelengths combined in order to find cluster members. There's a wiki paid on finding cluster members to try to understand how this works for young stars. Um, but really in the end, putting eyeballs on images helps a lot, especially in the optical. And the higher spatial resolution you can get, the better. There's also a page on the wiki on resolution. So here are some wise diagrams. This one comes from a Taurus paper that we were using that uh, we were using to find wise to find objects in Taurus, which is a big star forming region. So here we have wise one versus wise one minus wise four. A lot of points have been chopped out. You can see it's kind of got a flat edge here and sort of a funny step function. That's because that was our very first cut to weed out all the things down there that we were pretty sure were not going to be young stars in Taurus. These are the things that survived a whole series of color cuts. But then we actually started to look at SEDs and put eyeballs on images. The pluses are known young stars. You can see they're often very bright, but not always. You can see that we threw out 
a lot of galaxies. The X's are galaxies, even some very bright things. Okay, these are probably foreground stars, admittedly. But there are things over here that are likely galaxies. And then the circles were the things that were left that we thought were possible young stars. And you can see there's, you know, the search area in the bright end has been done pretty thoroughly, so we didn't find a lot. But because people hadn't yet started looking at the fainter end, we have many more candidates down in the fainter end because that's where there were new things to be found. Now chances are pretty good that the things here, once we go and take spectra, are going to turn out to be galaxies, but to the best of our knowledge, at, this, at the time of this paper, we thought they were going to be young stars. So here are some nice SEDs for some of those objects. Again, it's energy as a function of wavelength, um, both in the log. And so I've combined data from a huge number of surveys here. The stars are Sloan data. The pluses are optical data from the literature. The uh, Xs, I don't, is, there's one there, comes from the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope observations. The diamonds are two mass, J, H, and K. The triangles in here are from a, a Japanese mission called Akari. The stars are Y's data. The circles are IRAC data. And the squares are MIPS data. This one is so bright, we got observations at all three MIPS bands, four Y's bands, Akari and Y's, and this is a very famous young star. So you can see that there's photosphere here, and then big disk, photosphere, big disk, photosphere, big disk, photosphere, little disk. Okay, the plain photosphere probably comes down here. There's a little disk there. Okay. Um, these are some pretty hideous SEDs, things where Ys and Iraq don't agree, things that poke up suddenly, um, things that are really, really, really flat. That's way too flat to be a star. So there, these are the examples of the kinds of things that we threw out, either based on their SED or based on the, um, what we saw in the images. So if you get lots of disagreement between, I mean, Ys is poorer spatial resolution than, than Spitzer, to be sure, but substantial disagreement, because remember, this is in the log, so this is a huge, this is half a magnitude, half an order of magnitude off in brightness. So this kind of disagreement implies that the source is actually extended, so it's probably a galaxy, or you haven't matched the source properly. So it always helps to go back and look at the images. Now, I mentioned reddening earlier. Remember that sunsets are nice and red because the, 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 the dust that's in our atmosphere scatters preferentially the short wavelength, the blue light, leaving the red wavelength. And that's the same sort of thing that's happening in the, in the universe. You get stars that are getting reddened by dust in the interstellar medium. And especially for young stars that are forming in these dusty nurseries, you end up with lots and lots of dust that redden the star. So what I have in this movie, which I don't understand why it's blurry, sorry about that, um, is again energy as a function of wavelength and I'm starting with the 5800 Kelvin black body and it's the same one every time and this time I'm changing the amount of reddening I'm using. Um, my code asks for reddening in the J band and so I've got AJ equals something here and then a, I've converted it to AV for you. J is um, much is, is infrared and V is not and so you can see that the the V magnitudes increase much faster than the J magnitudes do. Now this is the same sort of movie as before where I'm going to start and run it again and again and again but you can see as the reddening increases it's pulling the blue light down first and then more as you increase the reddening it's pulling out more and more and more of the blue light. This bite that gets taken out is from silicates 10 microns. It's a particular kind of dust that particularly absorbs at this wavelength. So the important things to note are that the blue side gets pulled down really fast and you have to have crazy amounts of reddening before it starts to affect the mid-infrared bands. But because of this, if all you have is photometry, you can't tell if the object is a low mass star or a high mass star that has lots of reddening because the reddening is going to affect the photometry that you measure and it's going to change the position of objects in the color magnitude and color color diagrams. Both this video and the other video are in my YouTube feed if you want to run it again and again and again yourself. So here's an optical color magnitude diagram. V as a function of V minus I. Again, this comes from a, a real paper. The small black dots are just things that were in the catalog. So like I said, I like to plot everything because it gives me a sense of where things are clumping. The large black points are things that we thought were YSOs based on their infrared properties, 
But based on the optical, they're not in the right place in this diagram to be young stars. And so we threw them out, we rejected them. The red diamonds are the things that are surviving as YSO candidates after this. The blue lines here come from models, and they are what we call isochrones. They're lines of constant age. So the young stars are on their Hayashi tracks, and so they're going to come down and move over and land on the main sequence somewhere in here. Reddening pushes stars in this direction. So if I have a reddening of three magnitudes at V-band, a star that should be up here is going to get pushed down to here. Okay, so it's going to get fainter, but also redder. So again, if all you have is photometry, you can't tell if it's a high mass star that's been reddened or a low mass star. Ages though, because it's kind of parallel, that vector is kind of parallel to the isochrones, you have a, might, be a, might have a better sense of the age of these stars than you do the mass. It's more complicated than that, but yeah. You need a spectral type in order to fix, in order to correct for this. You need a spectrum from which you can say, oh, I see that this is a K3 star. So then that you can move it back and say, oh, it has a reddening of two and a half magnitudes, and so it should really be here on this diagram. But you don't always are lucky enough to have spectral types, and so this is the observed data. This clump of points down here are the rest of the galaxy. Okay, so these young stars should be somewhere along these isochrones. Here's a near-infrared color color diagram, J minus H versus H minus K. It comes from the same paper, so the little points are just everything in the catalog. The big black dots are things that we threw out as YSO candidates, and the red diamonds are the things that are surviving as YSO candidates. In this case, <clears throat> it's color color, so the magnitudes, note first of all, the, this vector is AV of 3 just like the previous one, but it's a lot shorter because we're in infrared here and it's going to push red in H minus K and red in J minus H, reddening. It's going to make it redder in both bands. This line right here is where the main sequence should be, so you can see the background objects are clustering around those colors, because this is a color-color diagram, distance cancels out, so you get cl clustering around that main sequence. This halo of points is, you know, either large error measurements or galaxies or something else entirely. All of the things that we kept as young stars though, if you push them back along the reddening vector, we'll end up somewhere on this main sequence or close to it. And so, if, again, if all you have is photometry, you don't know if it should be here on the main sequence or there on the main sequence. You know, you just know that it's got reddening, and some of these also have disks even at this band, okay, which also complicates interpretation. Here are some bluer bands, B minus V versus R minus I from a different paper. Here again, all the dots are just things in the catalog. The black line is where I expect stars without disks to be. That cluster of points is the stuff that's the main sequence. And you can see it's a little bit offset from where I think the main sequence is. That's just the reality of measurement error. And the red diamonds are things that we kept as young stars. These turn out to have an ultraviolet excess. It comes from the fact that they are actively accreting, and so they're brighter than you expect even in the infrared. But these two, here you have reddening. Here I've made it AV of one magnitude. It's even shorter. Again, it's going to push these reddened stars back to the main sequence if you undo the reddening. The reddening is pushing them up that way. You can even see the smear in the background of the points as they go out this way. That's the effects of reddening. So these guys, no matter how far you move them back this way, they're never going to intersect that line. These are the guys that have an ultraviolet excess from active accretion. Going to the mid-infrared, here we have 3.6 minus 4.5 versus 5.8 minus 8. The reddening is going to push it redder in 3.6, but surprisingly bluer in 5.8 minus 8. Why do you think this is going to be? Go back and watch the video with the increasing AV and look at where the IRAC filters are. Turns out this is from the silicate feature. That's why it's getting slightly bluer in 4.8 minus 8. All right, last slide. You need to start pulling all of this together. Color magnitude diagrams or color color diagrams are looking at many points, many objects in anywhere from two to four bands at one time, two to four wavelengths. 
spectral energy distributions are looking at the points from many wavelengths for one object at once. So you can kind of think of it as two different facets of the same data cube that you're looking at. You can have a suite of color magnitude diagrams looking at a whole bunch of objects in several different color color spaces and color magnitude spaces. And you can have a large number of SEDs combining you know, with several different objects with all their wavelengths sorted properly. You need to use both ways of looking at the information. And at the end of the day, it's really hard to beat looking at the images themselves because it can help you understand why points are where they are in the color magnitude diagrams and the spectral energy distributions.